until now, I've been introducing everyone uh, with a nice joke. I forgot to write a joke for myself. Uh, so hopefully the presentation is uh, it's, it's not a joke either. Ah, some people left over. Other rooms were full, I guess. Okay, let's, let's go. Uh, I need to time myself also. So this is uh, some multitasking going on. Will you be timing? Uh, so, hello, uh, I'm Roy, uh, I'm a software architect in the logistics fleet. I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, type safety, which is, uh, I know this is uh, not the most fun topic on a 30 degree day at three o'clock, but hopefully you can still uh, enjoy it a little bit. So type safety is a very vague term. So if you go to the man on the street, they probably have some kind of opinion. They think type safety is good, but they cannot really tell you why uh, other people might have a uh, different opinion. <laughs> uh, <coughs> Wikipedia also has an opinion. Uh, they say, in computer science, type safety is the extent to which a programming language discourages or prevents type errors. It's really nice, but then you need to know what a type error is, uh, and that's not really explained there, so it's still quite vague. Um, so what I like to say is, okay, when you write a piece of code, you're actually writing a contract uh, for the people that consume your code. And if it's more type safe, then your compiler can help you more to determine if you violate that contract or not. So uh, still maybe very vague. I'm going to give you some examples. So if you look at JavaScript, so this is a language that was designed in 1995 by one guy in six days. So the type system is a bit weak, a bit loose. Um, if you look at this example, for instance. So, ca can you read the code, by the way? Is it too dark? Yeah, well, yeah, right. So here you have a, a piece of code. We say uh, A is one, two, three, so A is a number. Then later on we say A is foo, so it's suddenly a string. And then A is true, so it's now a Boolean. Um, this is actually quite hard to reason about. So if you, if you look at this example, it's probably quite clear what's going on. But if you have a big code base and you start passing uh, A into methods and classes and stuff like that, it can be very confusing as to what, what's going on there. Uh, another example is, for instance, uh, this. So you have a, um, an object called product and it has a property called title. So I can say console log product.title and it will print book. Uh, but I can also say product and then brackets and then put in a string title and it will still look up that property title and it will print book again. And I can even have the example uh, it's on, the, uh, on line nine where I construct a new string with bits and pieces that end up being title and then I can say product P and it still prints book. This is really cool, but it also is very hard to reason about in an automatic way. Even if you're, uh, not auto if you're just a person, it can be very hard to reason about as well. Um, so what people do is they have workarounds for this. So uh, you do defensive programming. So you do lots of assertions. So uh, like with the previous example, you might, when you write a bit of code, you might check, okay, I'm receiving a product. Does it have a title property? Because I expect the title to be there, but it might not be there and the compiler is not going to warn me about it. So I'm going to check it. Uh, you can also write a lot of unit tests uh, to check all these properties. You can do static code analysis and uh, use a good IDE. And uh, these are tools that uh, automate this process. So they will go through your code and they will try to determine where uh, the variable A, for instance, in my example, is a Boolean, where it's an integer, where it's a string. And then it will try to reason for you and tell you stuff like, hey, you're trying to use it as a number, but it's actually a string in this part of the code. Uh, this works a little bit, but uh, in practice, what you will see is that lots of uh, stuff will break at runtime. And this is what we see um, if you go to any kind of website where there's lots of uh, dynamic stuff going on at some point, you cl uh, click a button, the button doesn't respond. If you go to your Chrome uh, debug log, you'll probably see some JavaScript error related to this. Uh, so, bigger example. So your boss comes up to you and says, we need to make more cash. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make a cash. Um, <laughs> I've tried to keep you awake, sorry. So bad jokes. Um, so this is the API. 
we have a cache in Java, by the way. Uh, it's a cache from string to integer. So I'm going to put in a, a key like Alice, and uh, it has the value 28. I'm going to put in Bob, and that's the value 192. Uh, and I, I want to be able to get uh, some results out there. So if I do cache.get Alice, I will get 28, hopefully. So this is probably how you will build it, something like this. So you have a, a cache with a backing store, uh, which is a hash map. So it's just a built-in uh, Java map. Uh, then you have this get method where you say, okay, I'm going to uh, call store.get. I wrap it into an optional because store.get might return no if, if it cannot find the key. And if you want to put something into the cache, it's actually very simple. You just do store.put. So it's just a simple wrapper around the hash map, basically. Um, so this is how you feel when you're done. Uh, I do my dancing on the inside, <laughs> usually, but you're happy. Um, but what's wrong with this code? Um, scream, if you can find out what's wrong with this. It's not thread safe, right, e exactly. It's uh, also, also my first arrow, so that's uh, nicely uh, timed. It's not thread safe, your hash map is not thread safe. Uh, so um, this means that if you put something into the cache and you do it on two threads at the same time, one of the values are, is not going to be put in the cache. Um, more bugs. Yes. Yeah, optional, again, nice, nicely timed because it's my second uh, arrow. Um, optional dot off uh, doesn't work with nulls. So if you uh, put in... Uh, null into optional.off, it will throw an exception because you need to use optional.off nullable. Um, something else still? Uh, true, that's not what I uh, was looking for sadly, but that's, uh, that's again one of the things. Um, but also uh, you can put in null here if you, if you are not careful. And again, that will also break the get if we don't fix this optional, but you could in put in null, but I was just saying I was going to put in integers in my example. So why can I put in null? Um, and you know, this is basically what, what Java does. This is how Java works and we can work around this. Um, well, I'm going to explain that in a minute how we can work around this. But all of you know how to work around this basically. But let's just go a bit further. Uh, I was just creating a cache which has a string as a, a key. I can also create a my key class which just wraps a string, more or less. So it's not, not more complicated than that. It's just a, a class that wraps a string. Um, I also have a getter and a setter, equals and hash code, and all of that good stuff. And basically it should work more or less identical to that string that we had before. Um, so this is how you might use it. So I have a cache that maps from my key to string. Um, I'm going to create a key, uh, Alice. I'm going to put something in the cache based on that key. And then I'm going to update that key. I'm going to set its value to Bob. So uh, the key I just used to put some, something in the cache, I'm actually uh, changing. Yes. No, it should be an integer in the example. So I made a typo there. So well done. Yeah, so uh, it should be my key to integer, sorry. Good catch, so uh, I didn't put that in there on purpose. But I'm changing the cache key. So I put something in the, ca in the cache and I'm actually changing the key and the cache doesn't know about this. So the only thing the cache knows is that there's some my key object in there that's related to 28. It doesn't know that I changed this to Bob. So line 13, if you do cache.get, you're, I'm trying to get the key uh, Bob, but actually it might work and will, it might depending on the implementation of Java and depending on the implementation of the hash map, it might still return 28. So even the key is set to Bob, the cache doesn't know that I changed this key, so the hash code, it might have cached it or uh, it might do other tricks and I might get a wrong result. So uh, again, if, if this is a bit fake for you, that's no problem. I'm just going to, I'm just want to uh, explain, uh, oh, there's an error, hold on. Um, I just want to explain to you, like, it's very easy to uh, write something that looks simple on the outside. So the cache that I sho showed you in the beginning, it looks very simple, um, but we made a cache that uh, works if you don't use any concurrency, if you don't try to get any values that were not stored, 
if you don't use any mutable key classes and if your data is immutable too. So it looks like a very simple, nice cache class, but it actually breaks in all sorts of ways. But the thing is, you cannot see that on the outside. So if I would only see the cache uh, methods, get and put, they look very nice. But actually, there's all sorts of hidden assumptions in here, and bugs also in this case, that you don't see. Um, and that's annoying. We can fix it, of course. So uh, the Davids example is very nice. We are going to put in a concurrent hash map. We're changing uh, optional to off nullable. And we might uh, add some stuff. So we might add these annotations, not null. We we're going to say objects require non-null. So if I now put in a null value into this cache, it will break. And that's really nice, but it will break at runtime. So I'm trying to use this cache. Uh, it's maybe already running for a couple of days. For some reason, I put in null, and my code breaks, and my service is down, or whatever. So that's annoying, uh, because again, we're doing workarounds for a weak type system. So again, I'm, I need to add asserts everywhere to just to make sure that all the input I get is actually the input I expect. I need to write unit tests to make sure that my cache actually does what I expect it to do. And I need to use static code analysis and I need to use a tool like IntelliJ or whatever to tell me that if I have a not null uh, annotation somewhere and I try to put in null, that it actually is not allowed. But the language itself doesn't really care about any of this. So that's really annoying. Because I was just telling you, like, you have JavaScript, you have a weak type system, it sucks, we need to use something better, let's use Java, and we have a weak type system that still sucks. Type system is a little bit better in Java. So there are lots of issues in JavaScript that you don't have in Java, so that's at least an improvement already. So that's better. Um, but there's still room for improvement, I guess. There are two ways you can fix it. So option A is to just uh, give up. This is what Java does, and this is what Go does, and uh, tons of other languages. They just say, this is the type system we have. It's good enough. If you need more, then yeah, just use better tooling, write more tests, it's fine. Uh, option B is actually uh, dealing with it. So uh, this is what other languages do. Um, so there's uh, 2010, I think, Mozilla was writing uh, Firefox. The, do you know the browser, right? You all used it. Um, and it's quite hard to write a browser because you need to have an HTML parser in there, you need to have a JavaScript engine, there's CSS parsing, rendering, virtual machines, WebGL, all that kind of stuff. Uh, it needs to work all the time because literally hundreds of millions of people are using it. So if there's, if there's bugs in there, then people will be affected all, all day. Uh, if there are memory leaks, then your browser will just crash after three hours of usage. This is what happened with Firefox in 2010. Uh, it might still happen occasionally, I guess. Um, what Chrome did, Google Chrome, is they dealt with it by just moving every tab into a separate process. So they just said, oh, every tab you open is a separate process. If that tab crashes, then at least the rest of your browser is not broken. So uh, that's, that's basically option A to me. <laughs> right? Um, option B is to take a look at, okay, how can we improve the tooling and the languages to uh, make sure that all of these dumb issues that we uh, run into, like concurrency issues and uh, race conditions, memory issues, that they are uh, dealt with. And there was an internal employee at M uh, Mozilla at that time, and he was working on a little toy language called Rust. Um, and he said, I have this uh, solution. Uh, he also had this logo for Rust, which is a bit unfortunate. I'm not going to explain why the logo of Rust is a crap, so trust me on this. Um, but basically, they decided we're going to rewrite parts of Firefox in this new language, and we're going to gradually replace all the moving parts of Firefox with new code written in a new language, and that hopefully will work out. And that's what they did. They started eight years ago. And I think the earlier this year, they released the first version of Firefox called Quantum, which actually does some uh, Rust rendering. And uh, people have reported that it's actually more stable, uses less memory. So, so far, it seems to uh, work out. Um, so let's create a simple cache again. This time, I'm going to do it in Rust. I'm also going to check my time. Ah, still doing OK. So this is what a, a cache uh, interface looks like, more or less, in Rust. So a trade, it's not like an interface, but for the purposes of this talk, it's an interface. 
And already you, uh, you see a couple of things. So, so it looks very much like Java, right? So you have a cache from key to value. You do a get, you do a put. Uh, if you do the get, you get an option type, things like that. Um, already you see this uh, self, and that means uh, it's like the this pointer in Java. So it's a reference to, your, to the cache in this case. By default, everything is immutable in Rust. So if you want to mute, mutate something, you have to prefix it with mut, that you see there on uh, line four. So um, line two already tells me uh, it's a reference to self. It's not a mutable self. So I know that get doesn't change the cache. So this already means that if I want to get something out of the cache, that's never going to be a threat safety issue unless someone's also putting at the same time. But at least the getting is a safe thing you can always do. You can also, also uh, share this cache between all sorts of threats. You can share it between objects. Uh, the cache itself is not going to change. Also, the option there uh, is always returning an option. So uh, unlike uh, Java, where you might have an option, but you might also get an in, uh, exception that blows up in your face, in Rust, we say there's always an option. So you get either some value or none. Uh, for put, same thing, except here uh, we're actually changing the cache. And we're um, taking the key and the value. Um, we're also copying the key and the value. So um, you have to specify in Rust if you want to take a reference to a value or if you want to copy it. So in this case, I'm copying this key. So this, the bug that I presented before where secretly behind the back of the cache I can change the key because I'm wrapping a string and I'm secretly changing the string. That's not possible here because I'm just, I just copied the key into uh, the cache and you can change it all you want, but I'm not, the cache doesn't care about this copy anymore. Um, then we start implementing it. Um, you see some uh, stuff uh, behind the K there, it says EQ plus hash. Uh, we can actually uh, add more stuff there. But um, it's basically uh, specifies how I expect this key to behave. For the value, I could have done the same thing. But basically, I'm saying, okay, this key, I expect it to be, uh, to be um, have some equality. So I can compare one key with another key. I expect there to be a hash, so I can use it in a hash map, maybe. Uh, the other stuff you just saw, send and sync, is also really useful. Uh, it's out of scope for now, but it tells me that I can share this key between threads or not, because that can also be very, uh, very useful property. So this is all stuff I can do at compile time. Then I'm going to test my cache, and uh, it's basically, yeah, the, more, the code more or less looks like you would write in Java, but with a syntax that has a bit more exclamation points and hashes and ampersands. But the, 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 the way you use it is pretty simple. Skip this. Um, and the implementation of this cache is also quite simple. So the get, I'm just uh, referring to an underlying hash map again. So self.storage.get and then the key. And if I want to put something, I say self.storage.insert. So I'm writing more or less the same code. I'm writing a hash map, uh, wrapping a hash map, and I'm writing uh, some code around that. And it actually looks pretty similar to what you would do in Java. I've chosen this example to look very similar to what you would do in Java, of course, because real Rust is a bit more scary. But still, mission accomplished. It works. If you use concurrency, it will work. If you try to get values that were not stored, it will work because you will not get an exception. It will get a proper option. Um, if you use mutable key classes, that's fine because we made a copy of the key, so change it all you like. And if the data is immutable, uh, or not mutable, that's fine. The copy of the data is also in the cache. So your cache looks like this, or you look, look, look like this. So, uh, someone's happy. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Um, so it doesn't need to look scary. I have an example here. So this is a web framework. I'm going to uh, do a quick demo. I think I have some time for that. Five minutes left, so time for a demo. So uh, here's IntelliJ. Uh, there's Rust support in IntelliJ. So just use it, install it. Uh, I have a very simple example here. This is a web uh, framework, and I have a get call here. So slash hello, slash name, slash age, and then we will return hello, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to run that. V0.0.0, .0 so we still have some time for the release. And I have an example here. So I'm going to uh, do a get, localhost 8000, hello, my name and my age. Um, 
So, 23 year old William Roy, that works. Um, if I move back to the code, um, these annotations, they look quite similar to what you would see in Spring, right? So this is just like a Spring annotation, except the difference is that this happens at compile time. So if I uh, change this to not name, but foo, and I try to run it again, it actually complains. So I, I'm not using foo. I have a parameter here called name and age, but this is foo. So it says, you've not used this. It actually tells me wh where it comes from. So now I have prevented a, a runtime problem. So because if you're refactoring code, you might rename variables maybe, right? And uh, IntelliJ doesn't tell me this because the tooling is not there yet. So in the new versions of the Rust plugin, it will actually expand all these things and it will tell you this. But like everything in Rust, it's still a bit work in progress. But hopefully it's a bit more practical example of all the stuff I've been just telling you. This is the thing you would run into in your daily job, probably. Unless you write caches all day, but I, I don't know someone who does. So try Rust if you're interested. So um, there's tons, tons of stuff, tons of documentation about Rust. There's a tool to install it for you. There's a package manager like uh, Maven that also allows you to uh, run and build everything. Um, and it's the, if there's one thing I, uh, to finish with is that um, I mentioned like um, there's all these workarounds we need to do to prevent, uh, to work around a, a weak type system. So would there be a stronger type system than the one in Rust? Because we might run into the same issues again. And there's lots of research going on in that area as well. There are languages like, um, it's a bit unfortunately named, it's Coq, <laughs> but with a Q <laughs> at the end. But it has this uh, thing where, for instance, if I define an integer, it says, this is not just an integer, it's an integer between 10 and 20. And if I add another integer between 10 and 20, then I get a new result type, which is integer between 20 and 40. Does that make sense? So uh, compile time, you can actually check that that integer is never is going to be below zero. And if this is like the height of an airplane, then that is pretty convenient to know at compile time. Uh, but these languages are much more uh, exotic. They're like uh, academic and Rust uh, finds a nice balance between really academic and really pragmatic. Uh, and that's it. So are there any questions? Yes. Someone should bring you, uh, let me just shout, I'll repeat the question. Yeah, the, the language itself uh, it does, doesn't do a everything for you, but it can give you at compile time uh, the option to, um, if, I, if my cache is not thread safe, basically, I cannot create a new thread and move that cache to that thread. So I can never have two threads with, a, with the same cache. If I add some annotations to my class, uh, like send and sync, the one that you saw, then suddenly I can make a copy of this cache, a, a reference to it, move it to a separate thread, and then now I have two threads sharing the same cache. But the implementation I just wrote um, doesn't really allow that right now, but it also will tell you that it's not allowed. So uh, 30 seconds left, no, no time left. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>